Okay, turn to Romans chapter 8. <coughs> Romans 8. <coughs> Romans 8 today, we'll be looking at verses 5 through 8. Romans 8, 5 through 8. Romans 8, 5, Paul says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue studying Romans, we pray that we're looking at the carnal mind today and the spiritual minded. And, uh, we pray that we'll be able to know the difference, that there is a difference in the two. And Lord, we know that your will is that we all, as believers, walk after the Spirit of God. And I pray, Lord, that uh, we can learn from this today and be edified and give you the glory for it. For we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Carnally minded or spiritually minded is what I put on the board for you. And to know the difference. And there is, there is a difference. And that's like when you were growing up, your parents taught you to discern what was right and wrong. And we all knew there were certain things we knew was right, certain things we knew was wrong, and uh, they taught us that way. So whenever you think about a difference between carnal, carnal, carnally minded and spiritually minded, there is a difference. There's a contrast between the two. There's a distinction between the two. And as we look at this, we understand spiritual minded is God's will for all of us as believers to be that way. And Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit is referenced 19 times in this chapter compared to two times prior to that in, in the book of Romans. So there's, there's something there that we need to see, and we know what it is. In Romans 8.1 it says, There is therefore now no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after flesh, but after the Spirit. So the thing we're looking at is to walk after the Spirit, and to be spiritual minded, we will walk after the Spirit by doing that. So... Looking in Romans chapter 8, the first four verses, we looked about the power is available to us from the Lord. And that power is when it comes to living an enjoyable life. The power is available to us. And we know there's power in the Word of God. We let the Word of Christ dwell in, in us. The Holy Spirit teaches us. That's how there's communion with the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to talk about that here today too. But Romans 8, 5 through 8, the way in which we're able to walk in this new life. We've got a new identity. And Romans 8, 5 through 8 tells us how that we can walk in this new identity. And you remember we said last week, a key word in Romans 8, 5 through 8 is the word mind. You see that in verse 5? For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. Verse 6, for to be carnal minded is death but to be spiritual mind is life and peace. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. So the issue is the mind as far as the, the, the way in which we're able to walk in this new, new life, our new identity. And we've got the spirit of life in us, Romans 8, 2 says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's the grace life there. Uh, we, we have that in us. How do we walk in this life? And the way we walk in this life, uh, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, this grace life, the way we walk, it, it has to do with the way we think. If we don't think right, we don't walk right. And that, that's, the, that's the issue when you look at this, Romans 8, 5 through 8, is what, how, how you think. And a lot of times that's why you hear people say, I don't like to read the Bible. I don't like to read at all. It's not nothing against the Bible. I just don't like to read. Well, you've got to learn to read to be able to think right. Because if you don't think right, you're not going to walk right. And if you don't 
think right, walk right, then you're going to be carnally minded. So you don't have, you do have a choice, but again, the right choice is what has to do with the way we think. I mean, you think about, how do you think about who we are in Christ? A lot of believers don't consider this, who they are. They'll say, well, I believe, I, believe, I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and he's buried and raised again, and you know, that's basically all a lot of people want to know. They don't want to hear anymore. And, you know, that's on the beginning there. I mean, that beginning right there, I'm, I'm saved there by believing the gospel. And, and by the way, well, I'll, I'll mention here in a minute, about believing the gospel, you're, I'm fully persuaded by the Word of God that what God says He'll do, that Christ died for my sins. And I'm fully persuaded of that. That's belief. When you, when you trust Christ, you believe the gospel. That's what trusting is. You believe the gospel that Christ died for your sins. And by believing means you're fully persuaded what God says He'll do. So He saves you when you believe the gospel. It's not through prayer. It's not through confessing. And all that, you believe that He died for your sins. And so we're, the Bible says we're fully persuaded of that. And, and understanding that, so how do, you, how do we think about who we are in Christ? Well, Colossians 2.10, for example, says you're completing. Well, I mean, the, when you got saved, you're completing Christ. And how do we think about what God's doing today? Well, so many, so few believers don't even realize what God's doing today. Here we are in this but now time period, and this is a dispensation of grace, and it's all grace, and what is God do, doing today? He's forming the body of Christ. And you think about the body of Christ, and if you're saved, you're in the body of Christ, and that's what God's doing today, but is that all that He's doing? No, He wants you to be saved, then He wants you to come to the, the knowledge of the truth and the Word of God about what He's going to do with the body of Christ. And that, you know, so many people, they want to hear the cross, but they don't want to hear 1 Timothy 2, 4. It will have all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. So uh, there, is, there is a difference. So how, how do you think about who you are in Christ? How do you think about what God's doing today? How do you think about the things of God that the Holy Spirit teaches us? And this, this is a good example. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 5. Holy Spirit's doing this. I mean, Paul tells you uh, how man learned about the mystery. It comes through Paul first. We all understand that. The Lord revealed the mystery to Paul. Paul reveals it to others and, and it's passed right on down. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 5, verse 4, Ephesians 3, 4, Paul tells you, says, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. See, that's the key there if you don't only read. And I, I'm thankful that you read here in this assembly. So whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And notice that the mystery. In verse 3 there, how that by revelation, he made known to me the mystery. As I wrote a four and few words, if you take the mystery and you draw your line down to verse 5, the mystery, which in other ages was not made known in the sons of men. I mean, you read it that way, because that's what the Bible tells you. The mystery which was not made known, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his, unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. It was given to Paul, Paul gave it to the apostles and all, and the Holy Spirit taught them, and it's by the Spirit. How do we get it today? We've got the Word of God, we've got Romans through Philemon that God gave Paul and he, it, it, the Holy Spirit wrote those letters, Romans 2, Philemon, they're given to us, and guess what? The Holy Spirit's teaching us today about the mystery. So, to me, when you do, you look at verse 3 there, and you see how by revelation he made known to me the mystery, and then you go down to verse 5, which in other ages was not made known. I mean, to me, it clears things up. There's a lot of people want to try to say the mystery was prior to Paul and it was in the Old Testament. It was not. It was revealed through the Apostle Paul. 
So I, I wanted to share that with you. And by saying that, go back to that's what the Holy Spirit's doing today. He's teaching us whereby when you read, you can understand. So anybody today, if they'll read Romans 2 Philemon, they can understand that hey, there's there's a the body of Christ is being formed, and it's a, it's a dispensation of grace. Paul's our apostle, Romans 11, 13. And you can just go on with that and understand that and believe that. And when you believe something, I'm fully persuaded what God says is right. So I'm, I'm fully persuaded today, and I know you are here. So regardless of what people believe, and, and I will say this about this time period we're in today, there's a lot of people, they want to hear the cross, and uh, there's many that are saved, but yet they don't want to hear grace. Well, you know why they don't want to hear grace? Because grace will make you accountable. And it, it'll do that. Grace will eat you up. You know, people want to hear the law, and they think, hey, if I can get the law, that'll push me and make me do. You hear grace, grace is what motivates you. It's not the law. So people don't want the law. They don't want grace today. They want they want salvation, but don't don't I don't want anything else. And that's that's the attitude mentality that people have today. So going back to Romans chapter eight, and we're talking about the Spirit of God. I mean, He's our teacher today. And you think about I don't want to be carnally minded. I do know that. I know there's a difference. I know there's a distinction between carnally minded and spiritually minded. And I sure don't want to be carnally minded. I want to be spiritually minded. So Romans 8, 5, Paul is going to make the contrast here in this verse. In Romans 8, 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. So you can see the contrast. You, you can see the difference. You can see the, the distinction here in this verse. So what we're going to look at, we're going to look at some things here. Paul's going to make a contrast in this verse. First of all, it says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Now that's, the issue is the mind. Notice that, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. The issue is the mind. I mean, that's, that's the thinking process. And notice there in verse 6, it says, uh, but to be, uh, For to be carnally minded is death. Well, carnally minded, what you do, you place, place the mind on things of the flesh. That's carnal minded. We've got a nature. We've got a fleshly body. We've got a sin nature that came from Adam. And the flesh, to place the mind on the things of the flesh. How do believers usually think about this? Well, when they place about the flesh, they think about, to be, they'll say to be carnally minded. I'm speaking about believers right now. How? The distinction that they try to make between carnally minded and spiritually minded, they'll say, well, carnally minded is somebody that, that commits adultery, that is guilty of fornication, that steals and lies and cheats, and all those type of things. You know, they, they'll, they'll list that, those that are listed in Galatians chapter 5. But what are they doing when they do that? Whenever you think about carnally minded, uh, most, like I said, most believers, they won't think about fornication, drugs, all this type of thing. But don't don't limit it, don't limit carnal minded to just things that's obvious. There's other things too. And when I say that, you've got human bad things, and also you've got the flesh, you've also got human good things. There's good things of the flesh, they're bad, but they're 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 good. You know, society says, look how wonderful that person is. They're doing a lot of good things, but they're human good, they're human good and God doesn't accept human good. And it's like human bad. He doesn't accept that either. So here's the example of good and evil. We all know the passage. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Talking about good and evil. And... A lot of people say, well, that's good what you're doing. And really, what they're doing is not good in God's eyes. It's, it's human good, but it's bad. It's, it's carnal mind. So, looking in Genesis chapter 3, and look in verse uh, 
5, Genesis 3, 5. For, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And I'll let you know the story here with Satan and all that's going on. And, and you're going to know good and evil. Well, that sounds real good. You, you know, know, there's a difference between good and evil. But what kind of good is that? Look in Genesis 2, 17 there. This is what the Lord said, But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So that tree had good and had evil on it, in it, or on it. But when they eat of it, they're going to die. So the good must be bad, as well as the evil. You can see both there. They're not good. <coughs> and by, by saying that, you're looking, you look at, look at this whole thing here. This, this covers a whole range of human good and human evil when you read that. What would be the first application of, of evil thinking? Human good. Now let me share this with you. What would be the first application of human, uh, uh, first application of evil thinking, human good? Genesis 3, 7, notice what Adam and Eve did. In verse 7, the eyes of them both were open. This is after they sinned. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. That's human good. Remember good and evil. That's bad too. God didn't tell them to do that. So there, there's the human good, and just it's just as bad as the human evil. It's just as bad as the adultery, the fornication, and all that. And, and I'm giving that as an example to you there. Uh, and another example, the Galatians over there in the book of Galatians, they were saved people. They were believers. They were saints. Why did the Galatians desire to be under the law? Why would anybody want to go back under the law system? Well, they thought that they could do it. They thought they could keep it. And the result, they thought the Lord would re reward them. They were trying to do human good. That's what they were trying to do. Just like the tree of good and evil. The good, that's human good. It's bad. Evil. Good and evil. They're both, they're both bad. God will not, will not accept either one. Uh, so the Galatians are trying to do human good. Well, what's the result of doing human good? Just, you know, here they are, Adam and Eve, so the fig uh, leaves together there. And so the fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So there's the human good there. Well, go back. What would be the result of doing human good as far as we're concerned? Romans 8, 6. Here's the thing about all of us as believers. If your mind, if your mind is not on spiritual things, if it's not in the Word of God and you don't renew your mind, re-educate your mind and let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly and have to be spiritually minded, if you leave all that out, you're carnally minded. And you may not go out here and steal and rob and cheat and all that type thing, but you've still got a carnal mind and you, you're doing human good, and human good is not accepted. And the reason I say that, Romans 8, 6, tells us something there. Romans 8, chapter 8, and verse 6. It says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And, and a lot of times people get all upset about death. Ooh, I'm going to die if I do this and that. Well, the context, and we know this, <clears throat> we talk about death in this chapter and it's functional death as a believer. I mean, you may die physically, but this here, this death is a functional death. You're not going to be able to function based on who you are in Christ as a believer. You're going to look like what Paul looked like in Romans 7, verse 24. Look at 7, 24 of Romans. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He is a wretched man. He is a miserable person because he is trying to do human good. He is trying to, he's put himself back under that law system, trying to perform, trying to do, and he couldn't do it. And that's why he said he is, he is wretched in verse 24. 
He said, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And this body of this death was a functional death. Paul, in verse chapter 8, he understands, hey, it's not, a, it's not me, it's not myself, it's not I, like it was in Romans 7, but it's, it's the Spirit of God. Walking after the Spirit, not the flesh. You walk after the flesh, you're carnal-minded. And carnal-minded means that you're, 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 it's a functional death. So Romans 8, 5, you're looking at this, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So he's making the contrast, contrast the, flat, the fleshly way of thinking, the way the flesh operates. And the flesh concentrates its thinking on things of the flesh. That's the way, that's the, way the flesh concentrates. You know, what does Paul say about being carnally minded in Romans 8, 6? He says to be carnally minded is death. He says you can't, you're not functioning based on who you are in Christ. You're dead. Not physically, but you're carnally minded. You're walking after that flesh. It, it also says, what does he say about being carnally minded? In verse 7, because a carnal mind is enmity against God. Now that's, that's an important word there, the enmity against God. I looked this up, and it, it, it helps you a lot of times to go back and find the first time the word's used, the last time it's used. What does the word enmity mean? Go back to Genesis chapter 3, and verse 15. This would be the first time enmity is used in Genesis 3, 15. What does the word enmity mean? Because if you're uh, carnal-minded, uh, you're, you're dead. If so there's death there, you can't function based on you and you are a crowd. There's also enmity, Romans, uh, Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity between thee, that's Satan, and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. We won't discuss all this in this verse, but you've got enmity there between the Satan and the woman. All right, now go to James 4.4. 4. Look at the word enmity. James chapter 4 and verse 4. This helps you to understand what the word means. I mean, you, you can look at a dictionary and you can look at Noah Webster. Noah Webster's a big help. But good thing is you can take the Word of God and look at these verses and, and get an idea of what the def definition of the word enmity means. James 4.4. 4. We know this is a tribulation period book dealing with the nation of Israel to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. So James 4.4. 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? See, there's a question. And whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So what would you say enmity means there? It means enemy. So you see how that works there. The verse, verse tells you what it means. It means uh, enemy. And by, by saying that, turn to Luke chapter 23. I'll give you one more. Luke 23. I love to run the references like this when I can see without a doubt what, what words mean. And then there's some words that still are not as clear uh, meanings and you have to search, do other searches on it. But looking in Luke chapter 23 and verse 12, this deals with two individuals here about Pilate and Herod, Luke 23, 12. And the same day Pilate and Herod were made <coughs> friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. So there's no doubt they didn't like each other before that. Then when it came to doing something with the Lord, crucifying Him, all of a sudden they're big buddies. They could smile at each other. They were both politically correct. And probably deep down, even with that, they still had... You know, it was all outward appearance. But they were, the Bible says, the Word of God says, before that, they, they, they were made friends together. So, regardless of the, the whole thing, that, that's what the word enmity means. And for to be carnally minded, go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 6. Romans 8, 6. 
this is a serious thing for anybody that, that's a believer to be carnally minded. And we all have our issues. And Romans 8, 6, <clears throat> notice it says, Romans 8, 6, for to be carnally minded is death. Can you man imagine that there, to be carnally minded is death, but to walk, be spiritual minded is life and peace. So, to, for carnal minded, you're walking after the flesh. You're, and whenever you walk after the flesh, you're back on the law system. You're trying to perform. That's Romans 7. And it, it's me, I, myself when you do that. And you can't do it. You go back on the law. And when you're back on the law, you're a wretched man. Romans 7, 24 says. Uh, so you think about carnal minded, having confidence in the flesh, to trust in the flesh. Well, we're going to get to that in a minute about trusting the flesh, but you know as well as I do, you can't trust your flesh. You say, I can't trust people today. Well, you can't even trust yourself. So that's why you got you can't be carnally minded. But there's one contrast that I've given you in Romans 8, 5. There, for they that are after flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Here's the second one. But they that are after spirit, the things of the spirit. So you've got, you've got that now. What are we going to mind if we walk after the spirit? That's the question. We said the whole thing about carnal minded is a mind issue. Well, to walk after the spirit is also a mind issue. It's, it, and that's why he's telling you that there in, in Romans 8, 5. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit, what, what do we do after the things of the spirit? We mind the things of the spirit. It's what Paul's telling you in Romans 8, 5. Well, the things of the spirit, where does God the Holy Spirit operate? He operates in the realm of our thinking today. That's how he operates. And yes, he uses the word of God to do that. But you've got to think. You've got to use the Word of God and, and let God the Holy Spirit operate that way. And I, I'll tell you something about God the Holy Spirit. He's consumed with Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the, His ministry. It's all about Christ. That Christ died for our sin, was buried and raised again. After you're saved, after you believe the gospel, it's all about for me to live as Christ and die as gain. Holy Spirit's teaching us that. Holy Spirit's teaching us to walk after the Spirit, to be spiritually minded. To think, have the mind of Christ, to think like Christ thinks. So, that's, he's consumed with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is. And he's excited about Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. I mean, you think about that. What Christ did for us, he saved us. And the moment we were saved, we were baptized in the body of Christ. We are born in his bone and flesh his blood, flesh. And one day, he's going to give us a glorified body. So, the Holy Spirit's excited about what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Look at Romans 8, 1, the start of the chapter. And when you look at there, you go back because of what's already been said in the previous chapter. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You're saved. This, not, this is not talking about dying and going to eternal hell. This is functional death, as I talk about the condemnation. You, you're, there's no condemnation to them in Christ Jesus who walk not after flesh but after the Spirit. If you walk after the Spirit, you're not condemned. But if you don't, there's condemnation. And what did we talk about? The, the death, functional death part. And I won't go back with that. But looking at Romans 8, 1 there, what's God the Holy Spirit thinking about when He writes this, this verse here? Well, notice about us in Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation in which are in Christ Jesus. Well, when you believe the gospel, the Holy Spirit puts you in Christ Jesus. So that, that includes every one of us that are, believe the gospel. We're in Christ. So the Holy Spirit, that's what he's thinking about. He's thinking about us being in Christ when he writes this verse here, but also who we are in Christ. I mean, you think about we're sons of God. We're joint heirs with Christ. Now, the Holy Spirit's wanting to teach us all of this. And that's what he's thinking about. And not only who we are in Christ, but what we have in Christ. And what we have in Christ, I could automatically come up with Ephesians 1-3. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We got all, we're got we complete in him. Colossians 2-10. So 
That's what the Holy Spirit's thinking there when he writes this verse here and, and telling us all this. Well, how does God the Holy Spirit work? That, that's another question. And a lot of people have got all kind of ideas and all kind of ways and all kinds of emotions and that type of thing about the Holy Spirit. But how does God the Holy Spirit work? Turn to 2 Corinthians 13. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. How does God the Holy Spirit work? That's the question. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. You've got the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the Son. And the love of God is the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost. So you've got the Trinity. You've got the Godhead there. And you need to mark that there. I, I put a little triangle for the three. I do this right beside that verse, and so I know the God is in that all in that verse. But no verses like that you need to mark. So, but notice what it talks about the Holy Spirit and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Talking about believers there, be with you all. Well, what the question would be in that about the communion of the Holy Ghost be with y'all, what does communion mean? And uh, we've learned something in Romans 8 today. What's it take to be carnally minded? Mind the things of the flesh. What's it take to be spiritually minded is mind the things of the spirit. So we, we can learn from that there. What does communion mean? It means to mind the things of the spirit. Your mind, you've got to mind the things of the Spirit. That's how we have communion with the Holy Spirit. In other words, I'm occupied with the things that He's occupied with. And God the Holy Spirit's occupied with the things that's written in this book here. And Romans 3, 5, Lehman, that's, that's where we're at right now and but now. And God the Holy Spirit wants us to know about who we are in Christ and what Christ has done for us and, and all that. We've been blessed with all the spiritual blessings. We've been raised up to sit together in heavenly places. God and the Holy Spirit wants to teach us all that and wants us to know all that. And we need to have communion with Him. And He's occupied with that. Then when you do that, when you're thinking that way and you're reading the Word of God and you're understanding that, you've got communion with Him. You're communing, you're communing with have communion with Him. Why is it that's why it's important to read, to study, to memorize the verses? You want to have communion with God the Holy Spirit. And that's the way you do that. Because he thinks, he's consumed with Christ. He's consumed with the Word of God. And we want to commu commu have communion with the Holy Spirit. It's through the Word of God. It's a thinking process. Spiritually minded. You're thinking about uh, what you have in Christ. So, I I'm saying that to you, how important it is for me, and for you as well, to read the Bible and study it. Memorize. Meditate upon it. Think about what we have in Christ. Here's an example. Remember, I was talking about human good a while ago, human evil, but just human wisdom. Think about it on that line as we go over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I was looking at this verse this past week um, this way, and a lot of people have got all these ideas about these verses too. I mean, you hear... You read in commentaries and all and uh, this and that, but the Word of God will stand regardless of what man wants to try to say about it. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. It says, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Notice there, you've got, the, you've got the eye, and you've got the ear, and you've got the heart of man. And notice it's all about man, the things which God has prepared for them that love it. Well, you, you think about that there. Uh, can your heart on your human, this is human now, on your level, because you've got eyes and you've got ears and you've got heart, can you know the things of God? Just that way? No, you can't. And why why can't you? Now I ex exclude the Holy Spirit a minute. I'm just talking about human viewpoint. On your human viewpoint, you can't know God that way. Just with your eyes and ears and heart, 
Now why is it that way? Why, why can't just everybody know all the things of God? Well, that heart's the issue. And even though it's a time past, the verse, the Jeremiah 17, 9 is a big verse to help us. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. Isaiah, Jeremiah 17, 9. And in Jeremiah 17, 9, when you read this, you think about knowing God. I mean, everybody knows, and we're not talking about you know there is a God. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the things of God, to know. You can't just because you see and hear and you've got a heart, hey, I can, I can learn it myself. But Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. The heart's bad. So that tells you something. You go back over there to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and you, you see this here. Uh, why do our hearts know nothing about God? Well, we're wicked. That's why. But after you get saved, you hear the gospel, you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes in you, then that's a different story. You can learn. So look at that. Read on down there. I can say in 1 Corinthians 2 9, God will not allow man to use human wisdom to know God. We're talking about human wisdom now. He'll not allow human wisdom to know God. But what happens in verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. See, it takes the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. How does God reveal them unto us? By His Spirit. Well, look up, read on down, verse 13. Which things also we speak not in the words, notice this words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things to spiritual. You see that? Human wisdom won't get it, in verse 9. But what you're saying, the Holy Spirit, you allow the Holy Spirit to teach you, and believe in what the Word of God says, then that's how you get it. Because the Holy Ghost is teaching words in 1 Corinthians 2.13, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit, but I'm sorry, verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. You've got words, plural. What do you have in the Bible? You have words. And notice it says, by which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things to spiritual. So you think about the Holy Spirit, and you go, back, go to John 14. John 14, this is in time past. John 14, 17. John 14, 17. John 14, 17. And also John 17, 17. We'll read 14, 17 first. In John 14, 17, notice what it says. Even the Spirit of truth. You remember we got words over there in 1 Corinthians. Holy Spirit is by words. Well, John 14, 17, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but we know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So you've got the Spirit of truth. Well, look in John 17, 17. So you've got 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So what you've got, you've got words, you've got the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is truth, then thy word is truth. You see what the Holy Spirit does? He takes the Word of God and He teaches you the things of God that man's wisdom can't learn. And I mean, that's, that's how important that is. Uh, so, a lot of people have got the idea, hey, I can just sit down and I can read the Bible and I'll understand it in all one setting and I'm done with it, and it's not that way. You've got the Holy Spirit as your teacher, and you have, you've got to have the right attitude. You've got to have the mind there, the spiritual mind. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. If you're following Paul, and you've got to understand who, you're, who it's written to, and, and all that, rightly divided. And by doing all that, believe what you read, then you can learn. The Holy Spirit will teach you. I found this quote. It says, To change the way that we think, is harder than raising the dead. 
That's the truth. The dead would rise faster than people changing their minds about what they believe. The, the, way, the change of the way that we, the way we think. People don't want to think. They don't, they don't want the Word of God. And like I said, grace is the issue because grace will make you do something. You'll have to do it if you listen to it and read it. You, it'll change your mind. Your mindset completely. So my, my time's up and I'll say this. You know, taking our mind and placing it on the things of the Spirit. That's, that's the whole thing. Carnal minded or spiritually minded to know the difference between carnally minded and spiritually minded. Get, and, I, I, and I suggest to us all, read the Word, study the Word, put it in our inner man, build up the doctrine in us, and have a mind of Christ, walk after the Spirit, and have a spiritual mind.